shooting before they tried to take it off. Okay. Well, they, they had, what they had was a, what's called a watchdog timer for a process to, to end. And it yeah. took longer than they expected. So their watchdog timer expired. And so the software declared that something was wrong and they, they you know, so they went and looked at it and they decided nothing really was wrong. They had to modify the watchdog timer, but that meant they had to do a software reload of the, of the helicopter. So that's what took a while. You realize we're going to have to repeat all this on the show, don't you? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I hate to waste. Hi, no, he's, Hi. he's been recorded from a few minutes ago. Hi, so it's on there. Oh, is there? <laughs> well, I got so many points that are important to get in, and I'll do it fast. And Tom Whittemore, welcome aboard, my friend. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Ron. Why, Hi, do, I, why do I smell freshly baked? bread it's because i just baked two loaves of course <laughs> one for me and one for you jerry yeah <laughs> uh, one of them's promised to a friend of mine oh, who's I'm sort of sure. involved in bread baking years and years ago oh okay yeah, I, just, yeah. I, I just finished giving you that those suckers get real hard after a few days don't they you gotta really uh, zap them if you leave it out you should probably put it in a plastic bag uh, but, you know, don't refrigerate it. But if you can't eat it immediately, then what you should do, Ron, is, is put it in your freezer in a plastic oh, bag. I hadn't thought of that. I fridged it. It was in the fridge. That's the oh, problem. yeah. That kind of ruins the, the sourdough sense of everything. Um, so, yeah. Well, I like it because it reminds me of my favorite cheese from Switzerland. What's that? Oh, big holes. Oh, oh Swiss. <laughs> okay. Something I just learned on a Jeopardy question. You know what makes uh, Roquefort cheese rise? You know what they add to it? It starts with the letter M. No. Mold. mold. Oh, mold. mold. I see. Yeah, that makes Most sense. It's moldy anyway. So. Yeah. Is it? It's all mold? I mean, our, our favorite tree, cheese here is Humboldt Fog. And it's, it's, it's encased in uh, vegetable ash as well as mold. It's delicious. Absolutely delicious. So there's the blue cheese and... is just penicillin, basically. I think in the in the cheese. <laughs> on yeah. uh, on um, what is the uh, type? Of, if that white stuff, that white powdery stuff, is uh, mold of penicillin that is on brie and camembert. Those are that's yeah. A... You know, Jerry, I think they use often use flour, the French, and you can eat you can eat that skin. I do. Yeah, eat it. yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think it's good for you. <laughs> So you, they, you think they still make penicillin that way in the lab? Using mold? <laughs> I, do, I have no idea how they do it. So have any idea? the question, who invented penicillin? Well, it wasn't really invented. A, a, Someone like Fleischmann or something? or Fleming, Dr. Fleming. I think it was like 1927, and he discovered it accidentally. Yeah. It was growing. It was growing in a Petri dish. Yeah. And they realized... The reason I remember that was when I was in grade school, St. Joan of Arc in Indianapolis, I wrote a little paper on it. <laughs> oh. I think it was later than that, though, because it wasn't in use in World War II. What? Was not, Chuck? Was not? I don't. I, I think it was a little later, because it wasn't in use okay. until, well, it may have taken a while to commercialize it, but it wasn't really in use until after World War II, I think. Well, okay. it, was, it came into use during World War II. Okay. And that movie um, with Orson Welles, The Third Man. Yeah. Was, oh takes place in 1946 is about the illicit black market in penicillin. Okay. I see. I yeah. see. Wow. So instead of throwing that sucker that went bad on his table out, he turned it into a serum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and on to another subject. It's hard to believe, Jerry, but tomorrow's the 20th. That means the next newsletter. <laughs> right, oh, oh. Oh, you're right. Oh. Okay. Okay. I'm not Last putting one. pressure on you, Jerry, but you write great articles. I'll write. write something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Down I to the wire. Eleven o'clock, essentially. Uh, <laughs> give me okay, the. I got, uh, I got ten fifty nine, but yeah, we'll, we'll get. Let's see if we can get going here. I'll click on the, the live now. I have a problem where it it brings up another tab, and then I hear everybody's voices, so I have to find that tab and click the mute it, so it doesn't garble our our sound, but we'll give it a try. So we're gonna go live here. Here we go, Ron, coming up close here. I'll let you know when it says we're going live. And why do I have to do, oh, got me up upstairs here. Oh, great. 
I have to sign in. <laughs> it's always something different, I guess. <laughs> Should have been in there already. Uh, let's see. Oh, All right. SBS for the unit. Next. Next. Two step verification. Oh, what a pain. <laughs> yeah. Where's my second step of verification? I'll verify for you. My stockbroker has this thing where there's, you know, secure communications. And he only <laughs> oh. sends me an email like once a year. So it means that my password is expired by the time I get the next email and I have to go through all this verification stuff again. <laughs> Four, six, eight. So I got my computer glasses on, it makes it hard to see. <laughs> Four six eight two two eight. Four six eight two two eight. Well, next time I'm gonna make sure I'm logged in already with the other accounts. Okay, so what does that mean for me? Channel. Um, all right, so when do I go live here? Live on YouTube. Okay, here we go. Try again here. Choose an account. And all right. Starting to go live. Or is it? No. Go live. All right, Ron Holt says, preparing to live stream the meeting. I think we can go. You, you says, can go. It says meeting is now streaming live on YouTube. There you right. go. I think we're ready. Ladies and gentlemen, is it space news time? It's our main stories of the week. Do I have the go ahead, Tom Totten? Yes, you do. All right, we're doing it. Our weekly SPAU podcast every Monday morning, 11 to noon, convening online right here on Zoom to talk space stuff. New launches, discoveries, rovers on Mars, little drones on Mars. We're flying on Mars. Comets and asteroids, NASA, the all new private space launchers all over the planet. SBAU stands for Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit, your longtime South Coast Telescope and Astronomy Club. Love to have you guys join us. If you eat this stuff up as I do, I'm Baron Ron Heron, proud to be vice president of SBAU, which not only meets on the first Friday of the month in Farron Hall and our beautiful SB Santa Barbara Museum of National History, excuse me, that's natural history up in Mission Canyon, and that is when there's not a pandemic going on. And the museum endorses and supports us. We cannot wait till we can invite you to our second Saturday star parties again. So on this eighth edition, episode eight, it is Monday morning, a big morning for NASA, the 19th of April, and it's series one, which, which means 2021. Gentlemen, let's meet the, uh, uh, the brain trust of Santa Barbara's astronomical unit. Now going on three years into our third term, Jerry Wilson, president. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Things going well in your family and homeowners yeah. association, I assume. Yeah, we're doing good. <laughs> All right. Here's your outreach coordinator and one of the best there is, Chuck McPartland. Morning. Good morning. Uh, the man's wrestling with the technical stuff and boy, he's a great technical wizard, former president of the club and webmaster Tom Totten up in the upper left corner. And former Westmont College science instructor, editor of the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit monthly newsletter, which just came out a couple weeks ago, and an incredible bread maker, I might add. Still to join us, perhaps Bruce Murdoch. Hello there, Tom Whittemore. Hi. Morning, Ron. Morning, everybody. Everybody's uh, out with their telescopes at night. Can't really watch Mars close up, but uh, did anybody hear about what NASA did with the little uh, ingenuity? drone helicopter on Mars overnight. Did that fly or not, Jerry? It flew this morning. Did it? It's about 3.30 a.m. Eastern time, which would be about midnight our time. Okay, now, yeah, I think I, I, I brought this up last week, and I'm not sure what the bottom line answer was. Have we ever had video from, from another planet, from Mars, where we've been more than any other place? 
It's all been single pictures, hasn't hasn't it? Well, videos are single pictures, just shown real rapidly after each other, and they make they make pictures, they make videos by doing that by putting still pictures together that were taken actually months apart, and it looks like the rover is just cruising over the surface of Mars. But a live video, I don't think so. I don't recall that. Well, there definitely was for for this mission because they showed the uh, that's right the sky crane and things. Yeah. Yeah. What? They the sky what? crane when they lowered the rover. Yeah, that was a video, not in real time, but shortly thereafter. Yeah. Uh, Tom, you want to show it now, or you want to wait a little later? You, we're looking up. Oh, no, we're looking down at the shadow, aren't we? Um, I'll helicopter. show you one thing. I'll show you the shadow picture. You can see Here the. Here comes. Well, this is the shadow one. Wow. That's the shadow looking, down below. Looking down at itself. But you, let's see the, the video. I could probably show that one. Well, they, that's the news conference going on right now. This okay. is the one where they, they actually showed the little clip of the of the helicopter going up and down and applaud themselves. Wow. <laughs> is that the JPL, you suppose? Look, look closely. There it's flying and then it's down. <laughs> So, but actually, that I think I think that actually took forty seconds, about thirty nine seconds or something. Wow. Well, uh, for the benefit of anybody looking in that doesn't know, how do they keep the part that's hanging below the rotor from spinning around in a counter direction? Do you know what I'm talking about? They have counter rotating rotors, so they don't have a torque force on the bottom. Is that all new technology? Has that been done anywhere before? That's yeah, been sure. done a lot, especially Russian helicopters. A lot of yeah. them do that. Oh, well, they do. Because I know that's it, with the US has a new helicopter too that apparently uses that. Um, and it's helicopter. called Ingenuity. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, there's one that's on Earth that we use. The US oh. military has a new one that has counter rotating blades. Oh, those rotors are going 4,000 miles a minute or something, or 4,000, 4,000 turns. 3,000 3, RPM. Re revolutions per minute. Correct. Wow. It says 2,400 here, but uh, I've seen 3,000. And it in four pounds, it has a transmitter, camera, all of that, and just four pounds, including the legs. <laughs> yep. Amazing. All right, we'll be talking about it, I guess, from now on. Bruce Murdoch's still going to join us. Did you watch any of that, Tom Whittemore? Uh, just uh, what you guys have been sending me on email. The, you mean the little ingenuity? Yeah, ingenuity. Yeah, I just, uh, Jerry, I think Jerry sent me the little movie and I, I, I looked at it this morning. And he also sent us uh, the word, uh, I think they're telling the world that a little piece of the Wright Brothers is up there on Mars, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did they put on there? They a actually piece, uh, they ahead, put a piece of canvas from the Wright Brothers original wing. Wow. The family had saved and they donated a fraction of it to the, to put in the, in the ingenuity. Was it pasted on the side of an instrument or something on Perseverance? I guess it's probably contained inside. Oh. It's, it was, it's pasted on the underside of the um, solar panel. Oh, okay. Someday they're gonna, I guess, delineate all the stuff like that that's been set into space. So like the record that Sa uh, Sagan put on the side of the Voyagers. And uh, I guess some of the astronauts in, of the Apollo series took stuff to the moon, mm -hmm. took a golf club and a golf swinging yeah. club and a ball. <laughs> Someday there'll be, there'll be railings around the stalled you know, rover and the ingenuity thing and, and tourists will walk up to it and, and look at the thing that has the railing around it. So, wow. but, but far away in the future. Well, another Elon Musk has something to say about it. He's planning. I've seen some incredible videos, as you guys have too lately, about what it may look like on Mars. Uh -huh. All right, this is our our weekly, if you will, look at uh, space news, and there's a lot going on. Jerry, where would you like to take us now in the podcast? Um, let's go up to today. The um, the night sky, according to the <laughs> magazine. Okay. But yeah, this, these are uh, quips from talking points I picked out of astronomy magazines. Okay, so I got my copy are, here. Okay. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Monday, just above the horizon, southwest at sunset. This is tonight. 
-hmm. the brightest star in the north sky and it'll be serious yeah. mm -hmm. and it's uh, near i wrote this down can't read my own writing it's too orion oh it's near the belt it's uh, it's supposed to be the the dog constellation the big dog and it's following the hunter uh, orion right so yeah so if you follow the line of the belt it points right. to it yeah okay we're getting graphics from tom so sirius is one of the big stars of orion it's part of the constellation no. right no it's part of canis major the big dog but oh, it's yeah. orion's hunting yeah. dog ah are we looking at part of orion with that no this is the dog following Orion. Right? Oh, the, okay. one of his hunting dogs. Yeah, they've drawn the asterism here to represent sort of the dog. But usually somehow the word Canis uh, reminds me there some of the giant stars that would totally engulf our solar system are in that constellation. Are they not? Have you heard that? Canis huge... is a dog. Huh? Canis kind of is dog in my the city there, is trimming. There are some OB association stars in there, Ron, that are big stars. Sirius is not particularly um, right. big and hot. Right. It just looks real bright to us because we're close to it. Right. A little more than eight light years, not Chuck. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's uh, uh, the point of this um, talking point for tonight is that there is a double star in Canis Major near Sirius that it looks like another double star up farther north called Alberio. This is a blue and gold um, pair of stars if you look at them in a telescope or a binoculars, uh, sometimes referred to as the Boy Scout stars because of the colors. I like to refer to it as the UCLA stars. <laughs> but, uh, go ahead. <laughs> But it, okay. is, it is kind of in the hindquarters, above the hindquarters of Canis Major here. So above Wesson and Aludra there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of make a triangle with them. It's up in that area. Mm. Yeah. It's also called Herschel 3945. Right. Named for a man Chuck, named Herschel. Chuck, yeah. did you want to make a comment? As the M41 showed up there, did you want to make a comment on what you call that at star parties, please? Yeah, M41. Um, is also, you know, there's the Pleiades M45 in Taurus the Bull, but in, in, in the dog, there's M41, which is another bright open cluster, and it's called the Pleiades. <laughs> Pleiades. <laughs> it's in a dog. <laughs> Can any binary system of stars be seen as two stars by the naked eye, or is that just not possible? Not even yeah. with telescopes, mostly, right? Yeah, if optically, yeah. just with your eyeballs, you mostly are seeing just optical doubles, not actual binaries. Right. But uh, Alpha Centauri, uh, I don't think you can split that by eyeball, but that's that's probably the would be the easiest binary to split. How about right. the Hamel star, the Dipper, Chuck? But that's that's telescopic. I mean, you got Mizar and Alcor, but the, they're <laughs> kind of optical doubles, I think. Yeah, yeah that, that's what I meant. I mean, you can actually see both of them with your eyes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, just for the audience, optical doubles means that they're close to each other in the sky, but they're not really close to each other. Yeah, that's right. right. Mm -hmm. Where, whereas binary means they're actually gravitationally bound. Right, right. rotating around each other. Or, are there or, any binary star systems that are closing in on each other and getting faster and faster, and we're going to see them collide? And is that known anywhere in the universe or our part of it? That's uh, undoubtedly. Yeah, not that doesn't happen so much if there are just two stars orbiting each other. There has to be something to take the energy away and slow them down. So there has to be other massive objects in the system, such as a star that's moving away and the other ones can move closer together, or there's planets or something that pass through close to them. But in general, two objects just rotating around each other by themselves will not automatically come together. In, in some of the symbiotic binary systems where you have like a white dwarf sucking material off another one or, or two stars so close that they're affecting their gaseous envelope, then you can have tidal effects right. and things where they'll collide, but mm -hmm. you're not going to see that optically. And if you're, if you're, I conjecture that if, if it's in a system where the, there's heavy amounts of dust, um, yeah, the, the two stars haven't cleared their area of dust, that might uh, take away energy by collision. 
Do we know that if, 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 is, a, is this winter Alberio's pair, are they actually a binary pair or are they just visual? They're visual. Just visual, okay. Anybody plan to go set up and look at that tonight since it's advised by the telescope magazine or Skyview or whatever? Nobody's. Not, it? not tonight. If, if not we were to, doing a public yeah. outreach, we'd be looking at yeah. it because it's colorful. Right. We often show that at uh, the Bacara because we have such a great view over the ocean towards right. the south. Well, no, speaking of outreach, as you just mentioned, if you guys have a school or organization and like to schedule a virtual outreach involving an online demonstration using Zoom, lots of graphics and photos, contact our outreach guy, Chuck McPartland. It's still outreach at sbau.org, right? Yep. That's an email address. Yeah. Well, let's go to Tuesday, tomorrow, which is the 20th. And asteroid 4 Vesta is back in the news, at least space news. It's near, near Leonis. Is that long for Leo? The <laughs> Leon? One Leonis. That means a star in Leo. Yeah. Okay. Leonis it, is the star. It, yeah. No. And they're on the Ron, eclipse. Leonis means that it's in Leo. The right. star is 51 Leonis. Right. But Leonis is not a constellation as such. It means it's in the constellation Leo. Right. It's it's the possessive case of Leo in Latin. Leo. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just so, Regulus, you know, the, the the main star in Leo is Alpha Leonis, for example. So, right. So. Mm -hmm. Am I right in saying that if you're going to zero in on any of the zodiac constellations, you're going to be looking low toward the horizon, or am I wrong on that? Sometimes low, sometimes high up. Yeah. Right. Not now. Not very low now. No. No. I mean, Depending if you want to look the, at Gemini, it's way, way, way up yeah. high in the sky. It was you know. nearly overhead for us. Yeah. But um, the uh, during the summer, the, the uh, zodiac constellation Scorpio is very yeah. low on the horizon. It says uh, 51 Leo is easy to see with binoculars. I'm about to invest in that, and then I'll let you guys guide me into the telescope world eventually, maybe before the year's out. But People can get outside even with our lighting, our poor pollution, light pollution. For these kind of objects, um, stars and star clusters and stuff, yeah, you can you can do that well from here. They're good. Yeah, objects, yeah. So. Yeah. I was just going to mention, if I remember right, if you see something called you know fifty one uh, Leo or fifty one Leonis, uh, fifty one is short for magnitude five point one. At least that's well, that's right. that. No, not in this case. Not in this case. Not in this case. Um, okay. It, it's it's I I think it's the buyer designation where they did okay. this, where they started after they used up a lot of the Greek letters, then they switched to numbers. Just happens to be a five point one, and they call it fifty one. Yeah, but if you're looking yeah. at a an AAVSO chart, which is the variable star observers, right? Then they yeah. will tend to put an abbreviation. They, they leave out the decimal point on the magnitude and they will put that designation on the star. So that's probably where you're coming from with AAVSO. Yeah, right, because I, I used to be in the AAVSO, yeah. 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 But how many asteroids can be seen with binoculars? Ooh. Um, down to magnitude, know. probably what, nine? Yeah, probably. It, it's like a tiny star. Yeah. yeah. It'll look just like a star. You can't see a disk, but you. From night to night, if it's in the right place, it'll move. That's how you right. tell an asteroid. Um, or, or if you know the sky real well, you'll see a star that shouldn't be there. Oh. The word asteroid actually comes from William Herschel because the first ones they discovered, including four Vesta, they were calling those planets. Really? And he said, well, I, you know, they look asteroidal. They, they look just like stars. Yeah. And so that term ended up sticking, and they, they called them asteroids. So, Ron, do you have a pair of binoculars now? What was your question, Jerry? I'm sorry. Do you have a pair of binoculars now? You know, I do somewhere. I think they're, my son may have taken them with him to Pittsburgh, or they're in the bottom of the closet okay. that I haven't cleaned out. I, wouldn't, I, I never have much luck using binoculars on the sky because I move or shake too much. I never oh, yeah. Think. Yeah. You need to mount them. There's no question. Yeah, My you question need to mount them, or you need. I would recommend you spend your money if you don't have binoculars already. You spend it on a small telescope. That'd well, I happen to have one of those too. Okay, good. 
but it sits on three a, a three prod three prong never mind Tripod. i have a question of chuck the uh <laughs> the guy who does uh occultations yep has the uh, four best to ever been has it ever occulted a star oh yes multiple times really yeah so when have you gone out in your backyard in the middle of the night and looked at some lately you want to tell us about it I haven't seen Vesta um, do an occultation. I'm trying to think what the biggest one I saw was maybe Hygieia, but an interesting one I just, a campaign I just participated in a couple of nights ago was there was an occultation of a star by a moon of a dwarf planet. Wow. So there, there's a dwarf planet called Haumea, which is way the heck out there. And uh, it has a moon called Hiaka and Hiaka occulted a star and the error bar has covered the entire United States. So just about everybody in IOTA in the States was out looking to see if they could catch it. And it turns out it happened in the north, kind of to the north of the path line. So uh, it was gotten from, I think, Maryland and Pennsylvania, to, uh, two people managed to catch it. So they have two wow. cords on a moon of a, of, a dwarf plan, of a dwarf planet way the heck out there beyond Pluto. Wow. Well, is Four Vesta in amongst all the other asteroids? Is it in the belt, or is it an anomaly going on a strange orbit? No, it's in the it's in the main belt. Okay, and it is not a uh, dwarf planet like Ceres. No. That's correct. It's not spherical. Okay. Do they know what it looks like? Is it potato shaped? Yeah, we orbited it with a probe. Uh, what is it? Do you remember the name of the probe? I've forgotten. Oh boy. Yeah. Anyway, that probe. So. Yeah. That was the one. There it is. Oh, for yeah, Tom, it. you're a genius. <laughs> it's a walnut. Yeah, okay. Did we get the orbiter back or is it still out there? Oh, the orbiter went on to orbit Ceres. And it's still there. Yeah, it's in orbit around Ceres, but it's not talking to us anymore. Yeah. Mm, it's not good. Okay, well, a lot of folks in the club will possibly be out there checking it out. Wednesday, you want to go there, gentlemen? Sure. While Tom gets us set up for whatever, concentrating on the darker sky opposite the bright moon. So we're about ready to get another full moon. Constellation Cepheus, the king, mm -hmm. uh, with um, the Garnet Star, Herschel's yep. Garnet Star. That's the yeah. big feature of Wednesday night. Who's who's watching that? This is one of Tim Crawford's favorite stars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this Tim, yeah. there's a blank space on the screen. If you're listening, you could. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely it. a Tim star. And yeah. we often pull it in at Westmont just for Tim yeah. with, with, the re, with the refractor. Yeah. You know, Gary Peterson up in the Palma likes it too. He, he oh, okay. It. Oh, it's gorgeous. Together, he, it's a big, big uh, red carbon star. Beautiful. Does the word Cepheus have anything to do with Cepheid, the variables? Yeah. Or is that yes. Mm -hmm. They were initially discovered among stars in the constellation Cepheid. So they're called, they're called Cepheids or Cepheids. Right, the first one was Delta Cephei, yeah, the first one. What, was there an ancient king called Cepheus? Yeah, king of Ethiopia, husband of Cassiopeia. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're both up there. God, yeah. And their daughter was Andromeda. Yeah. So for everybody, the Cepheid variables are a unique kind of variable star because they, their period is related very closely to their uh, absolute brightness or luminosity. So if you see the star and you measure, you time how long it takes to go through its cycle, then you immediately know uh, the luminosity of the star, how bright it is absolutely. And then you can compare that to how bright the star appears in the sky. And between the two, using the inverse square distance for dimming of a star, you can figure out exactly how far the star away is. So it's one of the major, um, what is it, the meter Runs stations. on the distance ladder. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's one of the major ways of telling how far galaxies are away. And it was the, um, who was that guy, Hubble, using the 100 inch. He spotted a Cepheid variable in the Andromeda galaxy and proved that the and Andromeda galaxy was outside our galaxy. Before that, it was a hot debate about whether the, our galaxy was the entire universe. And these other spiral nebulae were inside the galaxy. And he proved that the Andromeda and therefore the other galaxies are outside of ours. 
and the universe became very big in our concept. Yeah. And if it weren't for Henrietta Leavitt, he wouldn't have a handle on that. That's right. A lot of women astronomers have been overlooked for prizes. And yes, honor. yeah. One of them, they're making it up with the, um, what's that lady's name who's getting a telescope named after her? Vera Rubin. Yeah, Vera Rubin. Mm -hmm. Where is that going to be? That telescope? Chile. 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 Chile, again. They got the bright sky, or the clear <laughs> sky, not bright. <laughs> sky, yeah. Um, wow. Let me ask about Cepheid variables. Uh, does it matter what kind of star it is? Uh, it, um, the one in yep. uh, Orion, Betelgeuse, which yeah. is a monster, doesn't it get bigger and littler? And right, yes. Yeah, Cepheid variables are usually yellow giants. They're yellow giants um, uh, that pulsate. And when I say pulsate, they have radial modes, so they expand, contract, expand, and contract over days, usually days, but it, it can go a lot longer than that. Okay. And like, like uh, Jerry said, you can use the periodicity of the star to um, get a sense of its innate uh, luminosity and therefore look at the star, measure how bright it really looks to you, and you can figure out how far away it is. And so for Betelgeuse, it's kind of an irregular variable, so you, can't, you yeah. can't do that. It has to be a very specific kind of star to be a Cepheid. That's right. right. That's oh, right. So let's slide down the talking points to the variable star types. Oh, okay. First, a high level categorization of all stars. Intrinsic, you're going to have to lead us on that, Jerry. Intrinsic and extrinsic, two different mm -hmm. types. What is, what's the difference? Well, I think Chuck is our expert on variable stars. Yeah, Tom is. <laughs> <laughs> I, right. I study shorter, shorter period stars, you know, because I wanted to get a lot of data in one evening, you know, go through maybe three or four cycles. Mm -hmm. I study the kind of stars that uh, are, are variable, okay, they're Cepheid like, mm -hmm. but they, I, I, I could get about four cycles on these stars, okay, mm -hmm. and I studied a number of them with students at Westmont, and we estimated basically, um, we, we basically got the light curves on these stars, okay, there, there's a light curve, Tom just pulled one up. And so intrinsically, curves, one dot is one person sitting at a scope or an instrument deriving the brightness of the star at that moment. Right. And, and some of my, the best data I ever got was, believe it or not, Jerry, it's with that darn refractor with the eight inch. Okay. okay. Well, it has such a beautiful wide field uh, that you could get a lot of uh, field stars uh -huh. to estimate the variation peak and, and low, peak and low, peak and low. Um, uh, with these uh, variables. Uh, the particular kind I studied were called SX Phoenicis. Uh, so they were based on a star in the Phoenix, which is a Southern constellation. Okay. Tom, so, Tom. Anyway, the, the Go ahead, Tim. Uh, Tom, you want to say something? Uh, Tom Whittemore, uh, uh, did you use a camera on the refractor? And, and oh, oh yeah, yes. Said? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Westmont had a couple of um, uh, uh, CCD cameras that we used, uh, we'd have to basically calibrate the camera. Uh, uh, they, they were made here in Santa Barbara, this particular camera. Okay. Um, I can't give you the model. It's been so long since I've done this, but um, they were very, very, very sensitive. Okay. So we could study stars that were out to 17th, 18th magnitude. Often we didn't do that because the data got kind of uh, shaky. Okay, I typically like to look for things in the ballpark of 10th to 12th magnitude, okay, as they went up and down and up and down. And the other thing is, you know, I always look for good field stars whose magnitudes are very precise in the note, and they did not change. Okay, so they did not change. So I had basically a nice background star to compare these stars with, okay. The things I did was I was not going for distance when we were doing this, okay. I was basically trying to get the, the cycle out. And with the cycle, you could do some physics on the surface of the star and say something about the density of the atmosphere of the star and things like that. So I was not going for distance, okay? Okay, thank you. So anyway, mm -hmm. intrinsic variable stars, there are two major categories, intrinsic variable stars and extrinsic variable stars. Intrinsic, intrinsic means that something is actually happening to the star itself. 
And extrinsic means that something else is happening to the star, such as something as a cloud of dust is going in front of it. And that was the case with Betelgeuse last year. And um, um, there can be other things that pass in front of it. And so that you can, you know, you get it um, occulted at that. So the light is cut off for a while. In intrinsic stars, there's pulsating variables, which you can think of as a sphere of jello. And someone touched it on the side and it's still wobbling. So uh, it's kind of how plasmas act like that. Um, ionized atoms in magnetic fields. Uh, there are, so there are pulsating variables and like um, Cepheid variables. And then there's eruptive variables which experience eruptions on their surface like flares or mass ejections from our sun only on a much bigger scale. And then there's cataclysmic or explosive variables, star that undergo a cataclysmic change in their properties like nova and supernova, or like our sun will, it just throws off the outer shell and becomes a planetary nebula. Right. Most of these stars are doing it on a long-term basis. They're just constantly getting brighter and going back on a, you can nail it on a daily Stars, stars have a lifetime and they have different phases they pass through. Right. Um, basically due to the size of the star and how long it takes them to go through the burn, burning different elements. Our star is in its first stage. It's about halfway through it. We're burning the hydrogen and creating helium in the core of the star by fusion. Other stars um, are burning stages that are burning different elements at different times. And the transition from one element burning to the other is frequently a change. The, when all the hydrogen is used up, the force pushing out on the star will stop and gravity will win and the star will suddenly contract until it raises the temperature of the core and starts burning something else. And then it will slam the thing to a halt and it'll oscillate around a new uh, diameter for a while and settle down on it. Like so, when, yeah. When Jerry first mentioned size there, what he really meant was mass, not right. physical. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I'm just going to mention one thing. Um, uh, in the March issue of Sky and Telescope, there was a phenomenal article on uh, Betelgeuse, which is a variable star. And there was, um, there was a dimming of that star, an unusual dimming of it in late 2019, OK? And there was a lot of talk, what's going on? Was it a dust up and this and that? And it's really, no, no pun intended, this dust up idea is not settled, okay? It's really so It's an excellent article. If, if, uh, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's just beautiful. And it gives you a sense of these huge, huge, huge stars like Betelgeuse, okay, that are unstable. And the, the different parts of the star, very different from our sun, very different from our sun. Yes, it has a photosphere and things like that, but it has this molecular envelope and all kinds of interesting structure to it that I was never aware of. Very good article, okay? Just want to mention that in passing. Well, gentlemen, I don't know if you remember this, but a few weeks ago, there was a story, maybe it has nothing to do with what we're talking about, of something that appeared in the sky and got bright and then disappeared. Does anybody remember what I'm talking about? That was a Nova. A Nova. Is that a Nova? That was a, the, the Nova. I, I think you're, yeah. we mentioned it in the show a while back, that mm -hmm. there was a Nova in, what, Aquila? I think it was. Was it in Cass? Or Cassiopeia, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There have been a couple, actually, lately, like about three of them. Okay. And they're not supernovas. They're not the huge explosions. But they're where these stars have this extrinsic variability where they're sucking material off another star, right. and they undergo an outburst, typically. Well, you know what part of the sky it was in? Well, there were several, but one was in Cepheus, I think, and one might have been in Aquila. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it was the death of a star. No, not a not the death, but it was going a brightness, going through a brightness variation. That would be, it just fl flares up. It flares up. Yeah, that would be the case of intrinsic variable stars and eruptive variable. Mm -hmm. Oh, so but, it has burned up its hydrogen but the neighboring star is pouring hydrogen onto it until it burns up, until it gets enough on the surface that it can all of a sudden go off like a thermonuclear bomb. And right, you know, I just want to mention um, when Warren, Warren uh, Rogers, he was a, a professor at Westmont, I knew and re really, really liked him a lot. 
when he was in the, um, when he was a, I guess a high school student, he studied a very, very famous uh, cataclysmic variable star called Mu Geminorum, okay? And boy, those things you can't quite predict, they just flare up, get really bright, and whammo, they're down again. These are cataclysmic variables. I think Jerry mentioned that in one of his things there. Down at the bottom of this, it, play, it, it points out that Mu Geminorum is a dwarf. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a real famous one, Jerry. And I, you know, Warren did study that as a kid, wrote a paper on it, and became a part of the, um, the, the that summer program that we ran for five years at Westmont. Not, not, not that time. He, he was a, oh, like a junior in high school or something when he did this. Uh, is the word Cepheid uh, tacked on all of these stars, or is that a certain type of variable star? Are there non Cepheid variables? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and that, that caused some problems in the early determination of distances yeah, yeah. because it turns out there was another kind of variable star called an RR Lyrae star. Yes. They were mixing them, the types up. And so some of the distances weren't making sense until they figured out that there were these two different sorts of repeating variable stars. And you right. can, because of this, when I was a little kid, the size of the universe doubled. <laughs> you could tell, the, the, tell them apart by their spectra. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, um, Going back to, what was it, Wednesday, um, the Garnet Star. The Garnet mm -hmm. is shown in the picture. Um, it's mu Cephei, so not a variable, but um, appears in the upper right of the image. Mm, Garnet Star. Herschel's yeah, Garnet. Herschel's Garnet Star. He was struck by the color. And it looks oh. very yellow in this picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, is it a yellow star? No, it's it's red. It's yeah. Not, yeah, it looks like a garnet, a blood red garnet. Yeah. But when you look at astronomical pictures, these are all false color pictures. It yeah. Depends on the picture, on the filters you use. Um, these, when they're taken by amateurs, and a lot of them that show up are taken in RGB colors, red, green, blue. But for example, the Hubble uh, does not use RGB. It uses a different set that are specifically designed to look at different elements. And so you can't really get these kind of colors, uh, the colors your eye is used to. And that's a continuing, with Hubble, and that's a continuing debate. People say, I just want to make it look the way it really looks. Well, the human eye is not sensitive to color at that faint level. And so it doesn't really have a look. The, it's, all, it's, it's all taste in these pictures that are done for, uh, artsy look like this one. Um, if, it, if it's from Hubble, then it was done for scientific reasons and the colors can be anything. Well, there's red throughout the middle of that. That's not what we would see if we were looking through a telescope. Really, I, uh, it, if it was a super big telescope, you might be able to see that, but you generally cannot see colors in these things. The red is usually ascribed to hydrogen alpha. Mm -hmm. So, but you well, can, I've seen uh, pictures of the Rosette Nebula, which is the way I take it, it's dominantly red, but I've seen it green also. So mm -hmm. it depends what you like. Well, I have seen uh, Chuck McPartland's little laptop connected to his computer looking at Orion and it was all pink. I've yeah. never seen that before. <laughs> right, but if, if, if you just looked visually through the telescope, it would just look like milk and water, Ron. You wouldn't see the color. <laughs> Chuck, it, Chuck, it's right behind you there, yeah. They can't well, decide a telescope. Yeah. yeah, there, there it is, right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it. <laughs> okay, so that's the story of the Garnet Star. Any other stars named after precious stones that you know of? Is there a ruby or a pearl? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I think that's mm -hmm. the only one I know. But what's uh, it, it? Does it have a regular name or a telephone number name like? There's, a, there's about, um, I think there's 30 or 40 different star catalogs that each have their, and they've all listed a different ID number for the same star. Oh, so that's not one of the Messier uh, items, I guess. Messier is one of the catalogs, but it tends to focus just on uh, faint fuzzy objects, not stars. Yeah. Gentlemen, let me do a quick commercial. Even if you don't own a telescope or have a degree in science, everybody come join us. Anyway, we have college professors, retired physicists, as well as folks like myself who just happen to love new space-oriented events and discoveries. So join the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit by contacting 
sbau.org and we'll let you know soon hopefully soon this year maybe when we're going to be going back what is that you've got on the screen tom totten it says musefii oh that was showing how big musefii was compared to our solar system i just want oh. to show our web page this is this is sbau.org our web page for the club but let me go back to that musefii see if i can find that that's the newsletter it? which we all get uh, that's uh Tom Whittemore, do you know how many newsletters a month go out online? Um, Colin sends them out. He'd have a count, but I don't recall what it is. Well, yeah, Colin, Colin emails a certain number out, probably fewer than 100. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's put up as a PDF on the web page, so it's, you know, people can just download it freely. So you don't really yeah. know how, how far it's been disseminated. Well, let's rotate down to Thursday. Talk about the Lyra meteor shower. Yes, another meteor shower. Complicated radiant graph or plot or image. Well, what I wrote down, uh, it shows the peaks in the morning. Best time to spot would be after 4 a.m. when the moon sets. Yes, because you need darkness for these showers, and that always helps. You always want to look at meteor showers between midnight and dawn because you're looking out of the front of the Earth. It's like a car going through a rainstorm. It only rains on the front windshield. You don't see any on the back. So if you see uh, meteors in the evening, those have to catch up to the Earth. If you see them in the morning, those are ones the Earth is running into. So you see a lot more of them. And here it, it, it's better with a dark, a dark sky, so you want to do it after moonset. And that's where they came up with the four. This is not a very big uh, a, a meteor shower but it is running all week then peaking on Thursday at about four in the morning. You and this is a very first... bad star chart. Um, <laughs> better off if you yeah. just looked at the three bright stars that form a triangle there near the middle top, and that's the summer triangle. Those will be obvious. And then Jupiter and Saturn down below will be quite bright. Yeah. But they threw in a lot of clutter here that makes it really hard to, to interpret this, this diagram. Okay. Now it shows that as you asked, Last time, Ron, why do we name a star, a meteor shower that way? You see that there's the word radiant up there in a circle. And that's where all these meteors, no matter where you see them on the sky, they will all appear to come from that radiant. If you trace the line back, you'll get to that little circle there. Wherever that radiant is, that's the point that it's all diverging from as we run into it. So that's, uh, and that's in Lyra, and that's why this is called the Lyrid meteor shower. Is, is, there a a, is, is there a comet name associated with the Lyrids? I think it's, there is. It's a long period it. comet, I think, but I don't remember the name. You know what astounds me about meteor showers is it seems to me there's very little that astronomers like members of the club can do about documenting it. It's like a lover's night, right? You just count them. It's like going out and checking birds, bird watchers. You can't mm -hmm. video them. Oh, no, you can that, that now now with everybody having cameras and um, even on dash cams you can see these meteors come in and, and if you see them if you get pictures from multiple sources you can triangulate where the meteor is and where it was heading and then you can go there at the crash site and you can uh, a lot of times find the meteor or fragments of it now the one that came down in Chelyabinsk in Russia I'm not sure that classifies as a meteor, but it was very big, but it lit up everything, you know, blew thousands of windows out and stuff. And it was taken, there were so many pictures of it on people's dash cams that they, they knew exactly where it had hit. And they went there and they found some three, 36 inch diameter or one meter diameter chunk that had fallen in a lake. And so- yeah, And Ron, there are all sky cameras that, that have a, this big fisheye lens and people just leave them running all night long and then they can make a composite picture that shows all the meteors that happened during the night in one image and uh, they're usually quite impressive some people make a living collecting meteors they're very valuable you sell them on on ebay for a thousand dollars per chunk meteorites yes yeah, meteorites, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i know a guy that has one older than dirt yeah <laughs> i've heard that yeah, yeah we all have but now my understanding, let's clarify it again. It's it's the tail of a comet that a comet that once went across our orbit. Yeah. Earth's orbit. Mm -hmm. 
it's a okay. comet or some other body that sheds pebbles or dust or gas and it leaves that it populates its own orbit as the, a big look on it as a ring around the sun and then at some point the earth passes through a segment of that ring and that's when you get a meteor shower yeah it's like a donut yeah. donut yeah, What's it's that? not just a, it's not a flat ring or something like that. It's it's like a donut, like a torus of debris. But every one of those is probably no bigger than a grain of sand. Uh, there are some showers like that. The real fast, you know, just zip little white things that disappear real quick. Those are about the grain of sand size. Some of them are large, like a basketball, and they come in there orange or red and they show flame behind it and they'll break up into different parts and they'll be real long across the sky. Those are called bolids. And each meteor shower has one type that it favors. Oh. Yeah, I witnessed one of those in the Utah desert many, many years ago, a bolide. Mm -hmm. You hear a report, you actually hear it. And sometimes you can hear the thing sizzle as it m marches through the night sky. That, that effect, uh, that, I'm talking about, you know, really dark skies, you know, magnitude yeah. seven skies in Southern Utah. The sizzling sound, I, I, to my knowledge, has never been settled on what exactly that effect is, but a number of people have reported it. It's not. Mm -hmm. just... Some people uh, uh, claim that they can feel it in their fillings, you know, that it's an electromagnetic <laughs> disturbance. My understanding, my understanding, uh, uh, my understanding, gentlemen, of a comet is that when the sun hits it, uh, the uh, the moisture, the uh, ice, the volatiles. Thaws, right? What? The volatiles. Follicles. That's Vol your sand. The volatile. The volatile. Things that are volatile. Right. Okay. And, and it just goes out for millions of miles. Actually, it has two, does it not? Most of the comets have two separate tails. Have you heard that? Yeah. Why is that? One tail is made up of, of ions that are just, you know, atoms yeah. basically stripped of some elect electrons. And one is made up of chunks of dust. So one is the yellowish looking one is dust. And those tend to follow the gravitational orbit. And then the ion tails get blown and carried by the solar wind because it's charged. And yeah. so they have a slightly different trajectory. So that's why the tails kind of separate. And the, the ionic tail, they're also all the same charge. So they tend to repel each other. So it spreads out. Well, we haven't landed on a comet yet, but Japan has. Yes. Has, no, haven't they? No, the European Space Agency landed on a comet. Yeah. Oh, they did? Yeah. We, we came in real close to a comet, I believe, at one point. And we dropped a, a refrigerator-sized piece of copper onto a comet. Oh, really? that's right, yeah. <clears throat> that was quite a while ago. Deep impact. Yeah. yeah we, we actually have a comet in our kitchen, Chuck. <laughs> it's scouring powder. Yeah, we have a can of that, too. <laughs> well, the Atlas comet is still out there, isn't it? There's multiple Atlas comets, so... Oh. But there's one fairly bright now. What, magnitude 10, though? Yeah, Atlas 2020. Okay, well, it's not part of these nightly sky looks. Uh, shall we go to Friday since we got about less than about 10 minutes? Yeah, Friday is really cool. It shows a there's a lot of asterisms in the sky, things that catch your attention. To me, there's <clears throat> two of them that really look like what they are, and this is one of them the coat hanger. And the picture that's shown there, uh, the coat hanger is upside down, but you can clearly see the crossbar and the hook yeah. goes over the curtain rod. The other yeah. one is the Christmas tree nebula. <laughs> nebula, but uh, cluster. That the one coat the hanger tree. There's there's a really great Thanks. asterism that's up now. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look in the uh, kind of northeastern sky after dark, there's a bright orange star there, Arcturus. If you follow yeah. the, the curve in the handle of the Big Dipper, you arc to Arcturus. And if you look in binoculars or a small telescope near there, there's a little uh, arc of stars that's called the Napoleon's hat. Oh. <laughs> it, it's really pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. Nice job, Chuck. Yeah, I was just going to mention Arcturus is one of my favorite stars, and I've been sort of like watching it come up, you know, earlier and earlier and earlier each night because, you know, I take Wally around the house, uh, you know, before he goes to bed, our dog. And um, there was an exercise when I used to teach at City College that we used to do at the museum, uh, planetarium, where a student would 
focus in on a star one evening, okay? Record the time that they saw that star and like leave, leave a little soda straw or a pea shooter there. Come the next night and note the time that they see the star in the little pea shooter again, okay? And it would always be four minutes earlier, four minutes earlier, four minutes earlier. Uh -huh. So but by the time you have a week go by, you're talking almost a half of an hour, okay? Or a month is two hours, okay? So I've just been watching our tourists coming up earlier and earlier and earlier each evening. It's been a lot of fun. It just reminds me of uh, the museum, you know, and uh, city college. And how quick we move through the through our orbit. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Museum, incidentally, is open by appointment, and the dinosaurs are back. And I guess you can only walk outside, but we don't dare meet to get too close on a star party. Wouldn't on a Saturday night. Uh, yeah, but maybe soon, maybe this year. Anyway, but not scheduled till next year for now. If you look on the coat hanger picture, way over on the left edge, there's a little orange or reddish cluster of stars. And that's NGC 6802. It's uh, shown in close up in the next picture down. Uh, just. Uh, Is that an upside down <laughs> coat hanger? Yes. Yes, it's an upside down coat hanger. Mm -hmm. I think it's also called Rocky's Cluster, right, Jerry? Rocky's Cluster, yes. yes. Yeah, Rocky's Cluster. Huh. We know how many constellations there are, 88, right? How many asterisms? Oh, have we? <laughs> you can make them up. Yeah. yeah, that's in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. Big Dipper, Little Dipper, Seven Sisters. Uh, constellations are a form of asterism, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Or the summer triangle is an asterism, right? Oh, so, that's right. Yeah. yeah. The so whole we, bunch. We can finish up with uh, Tatooine. With what? Tatooine. Oh, I didn't part, get that. Part of a more yeah, American we're... culture. Uh huh. Okay. It's a, a hypothesized planet from the Star Wars trilogy. It was in the first oh. Star Wars where Luke Skywalker is a, uh, what is it, a moisture farmer or something like that? And, yes, uh, it shows two suns in the background, and uh, that means it's not it's it's an open question whether you can get a stable orbit around um, a double star system like this. So an algorithm was used for the developed and used for the first time at New York University and uh, University of Washington, um, or the New York University in Abu Dhabi. So. Um, to look at the stability of not only the stability of orbits in round double star systems, but if any of the known double star systems have a stable orbit in the Goldilocks zone, so they're capable of supporting a liquid water on the surface. And they've identified about uh, six double star systems we know of that are capable. They do, they are, they do have stable orbits and they are in the Goldilocks zone. So depending on the planet um, that you're on in there, what other conditions have to be met before you can stand there. But it would be a good remote site to film the next Star Wars. Uh -huh. Kepler, 34, 35, 38, 64, and 413. Five planets all around the star Kepler? Is that what that's called? Oh, these, are, these are different star systems. They're, oh. they're discovered by the Kepler satel uh, yeah, satellite or probe. So they're named after, you know, which ones they're in order from what Kepler discovered for double stars. So each one of those is a whole planetary system. Yeah. And okay. each one of those double stars is capable, and that doesn't mean they found a planet in that zone, but they're, they're capable of having a planet in the stable zone and, in the, and having liquid water on it. Are we capable yet of checking out the atmospheres around some of these things and, and, and checking out, what do they call the, the spectrum? Yeah. What? The spectrum, yeah. Some of them we are, yes. If, if, for example, there was oxygen found, we'd pretty much know that life was there to create the oxygen and they'd need something like plants, not, right? Not absolutely for sure, but it would be a good indication. Oxygen and water, things like that. Methane. A good indicator. Would the web, which is going to be radio waves, be able to give us some of that? Web is infrared, and yeah, it should be able to give some of that. That's one of its right. missions. Yeah. 
is yeah. the web. They're supposed to launch it now what, on October 31st, Halloween of this year, but it'll probably be scrapped again. They've got to get it right. They, there's no way to go up and rescue it like we did the That's Hubble. Right. That's right. Yeah, they'd be now, great. I wouldn't sell Elon short on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, earlier in the hour, we I talked about... We can't repair it. What? what Normal, you yes, we can't repair it. Uh, okay, well... Uh, regardless, if we did find life, it'd be 500 years ago, because that's how long it took the life to get to us, at least, probably, unless there's some out there on Proxima Centauri. Uh, let me do a quick promo here for the club, shall we, before we go? Okay. Eventually, we're going to be letting you know when those first Friday general meetings are going to be uh, held, the second Saturday board meetings, followed by star parties. All going to resume by the end of the year, we hope. Vaccinations done. We're all vaccinated. And if we're in the right color, we got to get up to orange. And are we waiting for yellow tier, Jerry, you suppose? No, we're waiting for orange. We're still in red. Yeah, we're waiting for the museum to make a ruling. Yeah. Oh. We can't go our own way on this. I got you. Well, the museum is good to us. Yes. We're one of the few. They support us in key ways. Yes. That's true. Well, I don't know how you guys have not heard the tree cutting guys outside my house, but it's been noisy as all get out here and it didn't go over my microphone for some reason. There's a chainsaw that I couldn't, it obliterated what you guys were saying. What's that, Ron? Would you say? <laughs> <laughs> you must have a very directional microphone. I yeah. guess so. I'm really glad of that because uh, last week, I think poor Tom had to chase people out of his study next door. He, Somebody was making noise. and Oh, somebody was at the front door, Ron. I, Is that what I, it was? I apologize for that. I didn't realize you guys couldn't hear very oh, well. No, that, that, that was different. You had to get up and go answer the door, but there was something going on. Your poor yeah. wife, Maureen, or something. But uh, Any uh, uh, idea of what you're going to be looking at tonight, or this week? Any of these things we talked about, Jerry? Um, I'm working on my telescope again, still finishing the last drawing to get the parts made. And that's that's I'm trying to get that put to bed and done. Well, that's yeah, speak that I'll be out with a telescope. Okay, well, speaking of that, Tom, tomorrow night, is there going to be a workshop? Yes, there will be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do people sign up for that or watch it? Yeah, Go to our website. Are you involved with that, Whittemore? No, I have joined them at least once. Uh, they. Uh, they often do astrophotography, and I, I just don't know much about that except, you know, studying variable stars. So I don't think I could contribute anything, you know, to astrophotography, you know. And again, I, I founded that whole thing to help people make, you know, good mirrors and, you know, suggest ways of making nice telescopes and stuff. Well, you know, Tom, uh, uh, yeah. let, let, me, let, let me interrupt you, Tom. Uh, there's a, I think a lady that Joe Doyle has recommended, uh, he wants me to put her, I put her on our list for telescope workshop because uh -huh. she's, she's looking to make a telescope, I think. So you might want to tune in and see if she tunes in maybe tonight, I mean tomorrow night, and see if she's mentioning about wanting to get into making a telescope. Um, you know, Tim's sure. always talking about his mirror still, so Jerry's <laughs> trying to answer his questions that's, that way. That's going to go on for a while, I think. Because, yeah, some things are very reliable. <laughs> I also have gotten emails from a couple that just got a telescope uh, wanting help with it. And I'm going to go help them uh, in about a week because uh, they're all vaccinated. And um, I, I also pointed them toward the Tuesday night workshop to, you know, okay. if they had any early questions. So, okay. You know, we need, we need to get their email address and put them on my friends of the SBAU list uh, so they get notified of that. I sent them the link. Okay. okay. And you've had as many as seven or eight guys on screen, haven't you? Had up to 12. Wow. Well, yeah. How in the world do you, 10 of them want to talk or four of them want to talk or uh, who? Well, we seem to manage. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I uh, enjoy this. Gives me a reason to live on Mondays and we're down to the wire. And uh, again, you can watch, can you watch the web, the uh, workshop on uh, YouTube or do we save those Tom? Yes. Yes. Okay. They're saved and archived as is this, this is uh, number eight. So I guess we'll call the message to a close or call the media to a close. Jerry. See you at, see you at number nine. 
you yeah. got it. Next week we'll convene here again. And thank you all. And stay safe. Keep your mask. All right. on for now. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Right. Bye, Take bye, care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.